Open up your Bibles to the book of Amos. If you do not know where Amos is, find Obadiah and turn left. (laughs) You need to know that preaching Amos is hard work. Amos wears you out. You also need to know that Amos made a lot of people mad with his preaching. That's why I need you to listen carefully to what I am going to say to you today. Because if you don't listen clearly, some of you are going to get mad. And we're going to spend a lot of time explaining what I was really trying to say. But some of you are going to listen clearly and you're still going to get mad. You're the ones I'm trying to preach to the most. Heard a story of a man up in the hills of Kentucky. They called him Deacon Brown. And he came down the mountain one day and he had his finest suit on and a suitcase in one hand and his big black Bible in the other. And someone said, Deacon Brown, where are you going? He said, I'm a fixing to go to New Orleans. Why are you going to New Orleans? Well, I hear they got lots of free running liquor. And they got lots of gambling, and they got lots of real naughty shows. I asked, well, Deacon Brown, why are you carrying your Bible under your arm? He said, well, if it's as good as they say, I might stay over till Sunday. Point is, you can be very religious without being very righteous. And the book of Amos was written to address that very issue. Amos was called by God to prophesy to Israel at a time when the houses of worship were as full as the pockets of the rich. Remember, this is a time when the northern kingdom was as prosperous as they were in the days of Solomon. Because of a weakness in the Assyrian kingdom, Israel had been able to expand her borders to the north to include some very important trade routes and money was coming into the country like it had not in years and the upper crust were very much prospering. The church houses in Israel were full of happy worshipers. And a casual observer might have been impressed with the nation's spirituality. But Amos was not. He knew things were all right, R-I-T-E, and all wrong. We want to consider how you can be right, R-I-T-E, and wrong in the eyes of God. So let's start with this Principle. It is wrong to think that more religion can make things right. We must never equate religious enthusiasm with revival. They are two entirely different things. Satan has been selling that lie since the days of Cain, that if you will just enthusiastically endorse religion, you can get God on your side. The reality is religion can actually be a convenient way to escape or avoid an encounter with the true God. Religion can become sick. And so here are some symptoms of sick religion. First, there is this tendency to focus on externals rather than inner change. You recall Jesus was constantly criticizing the Pharisees because like whitewashed tombs, they knew how to make the outside look good while the inside was full of hate. Religion can do that to your soul. Another problem with sick religion is that there is a tendency to become a tool of the powerful. There's been a reason why in history there has never been uh, or there has been revolutions and, and governments that have been overthrown. And often the very first thing that the revolutionaries do is they go to close the church houses. 
Because the state church has tended in history to become a pawn of the state. And the government learns, well, if we support the state and the church learns, if we support the government, then both of us can keep our power. And so throughout history, people have often seen religion as a tool of the powerful in power and a play to keep those who are displaced on the margins. Another problem with sick religion is there is a tendency to be man-centered more than God-centered. This is especially true in a place like America. We are so consumer-driven, we approach our churches just like that. And religion can become just another store that people shop at to get what it is they want. Well, I like that church because their worship service is fantastic. I like that church, I hear this all the time, because their preacher is amazing. (laughs) I like that church because their youth program. I like that church because of their worship minister and so on. And we approach church like we're shopping at Walmart. And we all know the problem with sick religion is a tendency to value tradition over mission. Religion produces right, R-I-T-E, right hearts instead of right hearts, R-I-G-H-T. Religion can become a way of committing sin on your knees. And this is what Amos is going to teach us today. I want to look in chapter 4 of Amos, but you need to remember when the northern kingdom broke off from the southern kingdom and Jerusalem and and the temple were, were down in the southern kingdom, the northern kings set up places in the north for the people to go to so they wouldn't be trekking back to Jerusalem. So they set up places like Bethel and Gilgal and Beersheba and they encouraged the people to go and do their worship of Yahweh there. And I want you to notice how Amos deals with this. Chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 say, Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the sovereign Lord. Now, please notice that Amos is not speaking to pagan idol worshipers. He's speaking to Yahweh worshipers. And what he is doing is he's making a parody of a very familiar call of the priest to come and worship. Amos is making fun by saying that to answer that call to worship is to go in sin. We tell people that they need to go to worship. You need to go to church. It can't do any harm. Actually, it can. You can sin on your knees. Worship can do a lot of harm when it becomes a right and a substitute for an encounter with true with the true god so what do i mean by right r-i-t-e worship well two things one it is right when it leaves god out of worship their motivation was not to find god Their motivation was to feel better about themselves. They bragged. He said, this is what you love to do. You bring your thank offerings, your your free will offerings, and you brag about how well it was that you did these things. By the way, did you notice he does not mention sin offerings? You see, they weren't going to church to get right with God. They thought that they were already right with God just by showing up at church. And their true motivation was to be recognized by others and to receive praise from their peers and to achieve some sense of a self-righteousness. And their performance of their religious rites actually gave them what it was that they were seeking, an increase in pride instead of penitence. It's amazing how we can get exactly what we want out of worship and feel so good about ourselves and not even need God. 
I'll give you a striking example. Sometimes I get calls from people who are in town and they want to attend the Church of Christ and they're visiting Des Moines and usually they'll ask, what time are your services? And I'll answer the question. That's an easy one. But one that's not so easy for me to answer is this kind of question, which I have received many times. Do you serve communion before or after the sermon? The very question tells you a lot about what the person wants. They want to come do their religious duty so they can feel good about it. And that's it. You see, they were going to do what they were supposed to do. Take the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day at the Lord's Church. They want to get that out of the way so they can go on and do what they need to do in Des Moines. They don't even need God to do that, to feel good. Their religion is man-centered, and it doesn't require the presence of God to achieve its objective. You see, right religion, R-I-T-E, is a way to avoid God. Henry Ward Beecher was one of the most famous preachers in America in the 1800s. He preached at Plymouth Church in Brooklyn, New York. And people would come from all over the country, visit New York, travel to Brooklyn just to hear him preach. Well, sometimes he would be gone. And he would ask his brother Thomas to preach in his stead. So one Sunday, Thomas gets up to the pulpit And a lot of people realized Beecher was not there that day, so they got up and began to leave. And Thomas held up his hand and he said, All who came here to worship Henry Ward Beecher may now withdraw from the auditorium. And all who came to worship God may remain. Why do you go to church? I want you to look at chapter 5. Verses 4 and 6 out of the book of Amos. This is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. For Gilgal will surely go into exile. Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. For he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. It will devour and Bethel will have no one to quench it. What's he saying? He's saying, stop thinking that the answer is going to the place of God. The answer is going to the God of the place. And we need to let God be the God of every place. I want you to see what in many ways is the very heart and core of the message of Amos. Chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, read this way. I hate, I despise your religious feast. I can't stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring your choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream. So what is the problem with right religion? First, it leaves God out of worship. And second, it's right religion. When it leaves worship out of life. Israel liked to go to church. But Israel did not like to be the church during the week. You see, their worship of Yahweh had taken on the primary characteristic of Canaanite worship. You see, in Canaanite worship, it did not matter how immoral or unethical you were or how much contempt you held your neighbor in as long as you enthusiastically supported the worship of the gods. And that is how Israel had begun to worship Yahweh. You see, right religion fosters the notion that what God really cares about are the right acts done on the right days in the right place. 
And then you can be assured that God is on your side. But what Amos declares, that what God really cares about is that we treat people right every day in every place. You can't seek God unless you do that. Remember, he said, seek God and live. Now look at chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Now, of course, I know that you can seek good and not seek God. But Amos says you cannot seek God unless you seek good. There is no more damning illusion than religion that leaves you unchanged. The God of heaven is offended by worship that is never life related. This is one of the most common themes of all the prophets. You cannot impress God no matter how enthusiastically you worship him if during the week you're treating people wrong. Look at just one example from the prophet Isaiah chapter 1 beginning in the 10th verse. It says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, of the fat, of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. By the way, that last phrase, your incense is detestable to me, is a nice way of God saying, your worship stinks. Over and over and over the prophet's rail, you cannot impress God without a passion for justice. And when we hear the word justice, we tend to think, condemn the guilty. We need justice in our land. Too many people are getting away with murder. Condemn the guilty. But when the prophets think of justice, they primarily think protect the innocent. The people that are on the margins, the people that have no one to speak for them or fight for them, protect the innocent. We think of justice as a static concept. What is our symbol of justice? It is a blindfolded woman holding scales and she's weighing how much good and how much bad there is. But Amos' symbol for justice was a river. An out of control, flooding river. Can you relate, Des Moines? And it's just going everywhere. And it's literally changing the landscape of the, of the community that it's flowing into as it overflows its banks. And Amos is saying, religion that honors God is like that. It flows into the community. And it washes and restores and changes. I heard of a well-known speaker that was at a Christian ladies event and they were trying to raise funds for a mission project and one of the organizers of the event asked the speaker to come up to the podium and pray for their offering so that they could try to reach the goal that they had set. So he got up to the podium and he says, I'm not going to do that. Why would I do that? Everything that we need to meet this goal is already in this room. Why would I ask God to bless you when he already has blessed you with everything you need to meet this goal? So what we're going to do is we're going to take up an offering and then we're going to give and then we're going to thank God that he has blessed you so much that you could be generous and meet this goal. So that's what they did and they met the goal. 
Now this, this is very important to me. It's, it's, it's important that you understand. I am not aware of any prophet that ever called for doing away with cub, corporate or, or public worship. That is not his point. This is his point. His point is that we need a religion that seeks God more than man and seeks the good for every man. So let me share with you what I think is the very heart of the message of the prophets and maybe the second most important passage in the entire Old Testament. And it comes from Micah chapter 6, beginning in the sixth verse. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amos was offering Israel a completely different understanding of the purpose of religion. And as you might expect, and we're going to see as we carry on through this series, he was severely criticized who, by those who, who liked their religion done the right, R-I-T-E, way. And the debate still rages. It's still going on. And this is where I need you to listen very carefully. Because I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to leave here thinking about this question. It's very important. The question is, would you rather be right about rights or right about wrongs? You say, well, I'm not getting what you're asking. Well, okay, let me give you an example. Your child grows up, goes off to college, gets a degree. They move away, and they're living in a different state in a different city, and they call home and they say, I'm really having trouble finding a church here. And you tell them of a church that you know of in the city and the state where they're at. And it's like the church that you grew up in. They, they do things right. They don't help anybody. The idea that they have of benevolence is a box of moth-eaten clothes they store under the baptistry. But your child says, you know, I did find this church down the street and... I've never seen a church that is so active in the community. They, they feed the poor. They're, they're caring for the homeless. They, they, they do so many things to reach out to people that are lost. And it is a blast to just be there and serve God with them. And you ask, yeah, but do they take communion every Sunday? Where will you tell your kids to go to church? Would you rather be right about rights or right about wrongs? I think I know what Jesus would say because he was criticized a lot by the right crowd about rights. Why do your disciples eat out of the fields on the Sabbath day? Why are you healing this man's hand on the Sabbath? And every time they did that to him, he would say something like this to them. Go and learn what this means. Now remember, he's talking to the most religious people of his day. Go and learn what this means. And then he would quote the most important verse in the Old Testament. And it was read at the beginning of our worship service. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Mercy is always right. R-I-G-H-T. And mercy trumps every right. R-I-T-E. Now you know me. I, I want to be in a church that has a high view of the Lord's Supper. And a high view of baptism. High view of justice. I'm a both and guy. Not an either or guy. But I want you to wrestle with. And I want you to rethink what people think of when they think about religion because right now in the unchurched world the dominant view of the church is not good i like jesus they say i just don't like the church 
That's because they like what Jesus stood for, at least what they think he stood for. And they don't like what a lot of churches stand for. I think it's important for us to wrestle with that. I think a lot of people, when they do that, they are scapegoating. I think that the real uh, issue is that they're avoiding the hard question of whether or not God has a call on their life. But as long as religion can be offensive to them, they will keep scapegoating. Well, let me share a quote with you from the book Crazy Love by Francis Chan. He writes, we need to stop giving people excuses not to believe in God. You've probably heard the expression, I believe in God, just not organized religion. I don't think people would say that if the church truly lived like we are called to live. The expression would change to, I cannot deny what the church does, but I don't believe in their God. At least then they would address their rejection of God rather than use the church as a scapegoat. I think that's right. So I, I want to pray this morning together that we can be a church where God and good are sought with passion.